بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم بیک ٹو میتھمیریکل میتھرز آف فیزکس لیکچر نمبر ففٹین لیٹس سی وٹ وی ہیو ڈن ان لاسٹ لیکچر وچ واز لیکچر نمبر فورٹین ان لیکچر نمبر فورٹین وی کانٹینیوڈ وتھ دا ڈسکشن آن دا میتھڈ آف سیپریشن آف ویریبلس ٹو سالو پارشل ڈفرینشیل اکویئنس اینڈ ان پرٹیکولر وی سالوڈ ویو اکویئنس فار ڈفرینٹ باؤنڈری والی پرابلمس So, so far in the method of separation of variables, we have used this technique for parabolic equations and hyperbolic equations. In particular, heat equation and wave equation for different boundary conditions and initial conditions. Today, we will continue with the same method, same technique, method of separation of variables to elliptic equations. As I mentioned um, in a couple of lectures ago, there are three main types of partial differential equations, parabolic, hyperbolic and elliptic and we are using method of separation of variables to solve these equation one by one. So we have already done parabolic and hyperbolic so this is now the turn for elliptic equations. So in elliptic equation the famous or well known elliptic equation is the Laplace equation. Alright, heat equation, wave equation and Laplace equation these are classic partial differential equations Whenever you see any book on PDEs, they will start off with these three um, second order partial differential equations. So let's consider the Laplace equation in a rectangle first. Consider the equilibrium temperature in a uniform rectangle. DXY is equal to 0 to X less than L. X goes from 0 to L and Y is from 0 to K. L and K are constant, so this, uh, this makes a, a rectangle. So we are trying to study the equilibrium temperature in a uniform rectangle. Equilibrium temperature means independent of time. All right. So let me explain first how we got this equation. Uh, if you consider heat equation in a rectangle, So rectangle is basically this 0 to L and 0 to K. Y goes from 0 to K and X goes from 0 to L. So this is a rectangle, all right? So in this rectangle, we are trying to study the temperature. So this is a two-dimensional thing now, right? It's a two-dimensional plate, right? Here, so any point here will depend on X, Y, all right? And the temperature will depend on X, Y, and T. It depends on time as well. So basically, you will get ut is equal to, now it will be uxx plus uyy because it's a two-dimensional thing. Now, in two-dimensional, your Laplacian operator del of u is basically uxx plus uyy. In 1D, it was just uxx. So that's why we are having this thing on the Now, as we are saying, steady state temperature or equilibrium temperature. Equilibrium or steady state temperature. All right. So it means it, your derivative with respect to time will be equal to 0. So there is no left-hand side here. This is 0. So the equation you will get will be uxx plus uyy is equal to 0. This is your equation, equilibrium temperature or steady state te temperature in a, in, in a rectangle. In a rectangle, so you will get this, where x goes from 0 to L and y goes from 0 to K. All right. Now, of course, boundary is this. There are four boundaries now, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So on all these four boundaries, you may prescribe temperature. So if you look here, it's uxx plus uy is equal to 0. ux0 is f1, uxk is f2. Similarly, u0y is g1 and uly is g2. All right? So what is happening is here, and this you have f1 of x. Because at y is equal to 0, you have f1. Here, at y is equal to k, you have f2 of x. At x is equal to 0, you have g1 of y. And at x is equal to L, you have g2 of y. So there are temperature prescribed on four boundaries. All right? So that's why the boundary, there are four boundary conditions here. All right? 
So you see, this is your problem. Ux x plus u y y is equal to zero. U x zero. When y is zero, you have f one x. When y is k, it's f two x. When x is zero, it's d one y. When x is l, it's g two y. All right. Although this is a boundary value problem, it turns out that the method of separation of variables can still be applied. All right. However, since the boundary conditions are non-homogeneous, we need to do some additional preliminary work. Uh, why we need homogeneous conditions? If you recall our heat and wave equations, we took homogeneous boundary conditions because when we apply method of separation of variables, then homogeneous boundary conditions also get separated. All right, but here non-homogeneous conditions will not give you anything. So you will get two ordinary differential equations, second order, but you will not get, be getting homogeneous boundary conditions with them. So it's not possible to solve them. All right. So what we do is we try to make at least two of them, at least two of them homogeneous. If two boundary conditions become homogeneous, then we can solve the problem. All right. But here we will keep one non-homogeneous and remaining three will be homogeneous boundary conditions. So what we do here is. As we know that from a principle of superposition, that if u1, u2 are two solutions of linear homogeneous partial differential equations, then any linear combination c1, u1 plus c2, u2 is also a solution of that linear homogeneous equation. All right. This is the principle of superposition. So by the principle of superposition, we can seek the solution of the boundary value problem as. We subdivided our u x y into u one, u two, u three, u four, where all u one, u two, u three, u four satisfy the same differential equation, but different set of boundary conditions. All right, different set of boundary conditions. So what u one is doing is, so what basically we are doing, trying to do is, <coughs> we are saying that u one satisfies this. For u one, <coughs> it satisfies this equation that. Here you have f one x. This is zero. This is zero. This is zero. So u one is basically zero on all three sides, and u one is f of x on this boundary. So basically, u one satisfies the same Laplace equation. U one x x plus u one. Y y is equal to zero. Same Laplace equation, but now one boundary condition. Second, we'll have this. That now you take uh, u two maybe uh, this one zero, and let's say now u two is f two x. Let's call u two is here. U two is zero here. U two is zero here. U two is zero here. So again, u two is also the uh, u two also satisfies the. Uh, Laplace equation. Similarly, you have u3, where u3 is zero here, u3 is zero here, u3 is zero here. But on this side, u3 is g1y. All right, and u3 also satisfies the Laplace equation. All right. The fourth one is that <coughs> u4 is G two y on the right hand side, and u four is zero everywhere else. And u four also satisfies Laplace equation. All right, so we have separated that u uh, x y into four of them: u one x y, u two x y, u three x y, u four x y, where uh, all U one, U two, U three, U four satisfy the same Laplace equation, so their sum should be the solution of Laplace equation. And now, one one of the boundary is non-homogeneous in each case. So if you take, let's say, U zero y, U zero means U one at zero y, and now U one at zero y is zero because x is zero. Here x is zero here. So u this will be zero. This will be zero. U three gives you g one y, and this will be zero. So automatically, you see, it satisfies the boundary condition. U also satisfies. You can pick any anything else. Let's say u x k, when y is k. So when y is k, this is u two. 
see when y is k u2 is f2 of x so u1 is 0 u2 is f 2x u3 0 u4 0 so again it is f 2x so see u again satisfies the given boundary conditions so what, what we are doing it at each we are uh, we have subdivided our one problem of Laplace equation to four similar problems each problem has one non homogeneous condition and three homogeneous conditions all right so that's why we we get the contribution just from one of the uh, one of the UIs and the given boundary conditions for U actually get satisfied. Alright, so this is the main idea if you are given a non-homogeneous boundary conditions you can subdivide your um, problems into more problems uh, so that one is non-homogeneous and other are homogeneous. So now here uh, we wrote one of the example, uh, one of the problems here that u1 satisfies the same Laplace equation but u1 at x0 is f1 of x and other three are 0 right at x equal to k it's 0 at y is equal to 0 at y is equal to l everything is 0 so you got just one non-homogeneous condition here and now it's very easy to solve it <coughs> right now it's easy to solve it because we have done this before um, many times Right, we have done, we, this is kind of Laplace equation thing because 2x derivatives, 2y derivatives, two unknown, uh, two zero conditions are there. So this will make it a boundary value problem and we will solve it. All right. So let's solve this equation which we have just written down for uh, u1. If we solve this, other three will be very similar. So let u1 xy is equal to x of x and y of y. It's not capital T now because y is the other variable, so I'm writing y of y. So therefore, the PDE for u1 gives a uxx, so it means x double prime y as it is, plus uyy, so x as it is, y double prime equal to 0. All right, so you can write x double prime y is equal to minus xy double prime. And if you divide by xy, you will get x double prime by x is equal to minus y double prime by y. So again, this is a function of x only. This is a function of y only. So they have to be equal to a constant. And as we have a habit of doing this, uh, as we have a habit of writing negative lambda, so I'm again writing lambda. But you can uh, change it. I, this is negative lambda. If, if let's say you decide to keep this negative with here, you can make it positive on the right hand side because at the end I want to get this thing x double prime plus x lamb equal to zero, right? So that, that's why I'm taking negative. So here x double prime plus lambda x is equal to zero and y double prime minus lambda y equal to zero. So these are two ordinary differential equations, one and two. All right, I got two ODEs. Now from the boundary conditions, bound, homogeneous boundary conditions are here, these. These are the homogeneous boundary conditions. All right, so I will change them first because this is homogeneous as well, but this is not both. I need both of them to be homogeneous, right? So U1 X K is equal to zero. So if I take uh, U1 zero Y is equal to zero, this will give me X of zero and Y of Y is equal to 0. So again, this whole thing cannot be equal to 0. So x0 has to be 0. Similarly, u1 of ly is equal to 0. It means xl and yy is equal to 0. yy cannot be equal to 0. So xl has to be equal to 0. So now these are the two boundary conditions. The third one is if I uh, write u at 0, uh, sorry, the third homogeneous boundary condition is u at xk is equal to 0. All right, so this implies u1 xk, x, x and y, k is equal to 0. So from here you will get y, k is equal to 0. All right, but the last one is non-homogeneous. u1 x, uh, 0 is f of 1 x. We will keep this for later because this is non-homogeneous. So keep it for the end. We cannot use it here. All right. So therefore, what we got is, we got a boundary value problem, x double prime plus lambda x is equal to 0, with x at 0 is equal to 0, and x at l is equal to 0. Second is, 
y double prime minus lambda y is equal to 0 but I am getting only one condition with that y k is equal to 0 that's why we, we will not solve this first because only one condition so we, we, we should have for second order ODE we should have two conditions so this fulfills the complete criteria so we will again solve this boundary value problem all right Right, so we will solve this one and again this is the same question we, which we have been using for heat and wave equation. So again uh, discussing three cases, all right, so again from uh, last lectures, from past lectures, we know our um, x of x is equal to uh, sine n pi by l x. In this case l is not equal to 1. Right, L is L, so n pi by L x and your lambda uh, eigenvalues lambda n they will be uh, n pi square, n pi by L square basically and n goes from 1, 2, 3 so on. 0 was not included in this case. Right, so these are our eigenvalues, eigenvectors and you need to solve it again you, you can verify on your own that how we got this thing. Uh, in previous uh, lectures we we had x0 and at x at 1 so l was 1 there so if l is not 1 l is l then this l appears here and here n pi by l square and n pi by l all right these are eigenvalues eigenvectors so i i am just trying to save my time here and you can you can easily verify how we got these vectors now because lambda is known here so i can replace lambda here so therefore, the other ODE which is y double prime lambda is n pi by L square y is equal to 0. So here auxiliary equation is m square is equal to plus minus n pi by L because it is negative. So it will become positive on the right hand side. So n pi by L plus minus iota. So therefore, uh, your capital Y becomes C1 e to the n pi by L x plus c to e to the minus n pi by l x and we have one condition so we can use it y at k is equal to c1 e to the n pi by l k plus c to e to the minus n pi by l k is equal to 0 from here so from here you can write c1 e to the n pi by l k is equal to minus c2 e to the minus n pi by l k uh, divide this thing here so e to the minus n pi by l k is equal to minus c2 divided by e to the n pi by l k so let's call that equal to c all right instead of uh, so c1 becomes c e to the minus n pi by l k and c2 is equal to uh, minus c e to the n pi by l k so therefore your y becomes if you replace the, uh, these y here, so your y will become c1 is c e to the minus n pi by l k and e to the n pi by l x and plus c2 is uh, minus c2 is minus c e to the minus plus n pi by l k times e to the minus n pi by l x. So here you can write them by combining you can write them c times e to the n pi by l x minus k and here it's minus e to the minus n pi by l and x minus k so instead of x you got x minus k x minus k and it's just c this is your y all right so therefore what you got here is So therefore the product solution is the product solution is unxt unxy is equal to xn which is sine n pi by lx and yy so constant time yy is just e to the minus n pi by l plus n pi by l x minus k and minus e to the minus n pi by l x minus k. 
So this is what you got. As a product solution, therefore, uh, the general solution is, the general solution will become summation u and x, y, right? That is u, x, y, all right? So that will be summation n goes from 1 to infinity, c n sine n pi by l x and this whole thing. n pi by l x minus k minus e to the minus n pi by l x minus k. All right, so this is your uh, general solution. Now use that initial condition non-homogeneous. Now use the non-homogeneous boundary condition. Well, that was u1 at, sorry, this is u1. All right, so u1 is, um, this is u1 and, right? So u1 and is u1. So u1 at x0 is equal to f1x. Right? So this was our first uh, only non-homogeneous boundary condition which is left. So you got f1x is equal to u1x0. So u1x0 is n goes from 1 to infinity. Cn sine n pi by lx and e to the 0, um, this is y not x. I don't know why I'm writing x here. This is y. It's a function of y. Right? If you go back, this is not x. It's a, it, y is a function of y. So this is of course y. And when y is k, you will get y here, y here. So it's y minus k, y minus k. Because y is a function of y not of x. Alright? So you got uh, e, uh, y is equal to 0. So you got e to the power n pi by l minus n pi by l k and uh, minus e to the y 0 make it plus n pi by l. So this is what you got. All right. So now here, from here, uh, you can easily calculate cn because this is again Fourier sine series. These are the coefficients. This and this is the coefficient of Fourier sine series. So you can easily find cn where cn is equal to, uh, not cn, cn times this whole thing is equal to, uh, because it's a Fourier sine series, so you can find from 0 to, and this is a series in x, so I will use the limits of x. So 2 to l, 0 to l, and f1x times sine n pi by l x dx. So this is, uh, so c n coefficients are 2 divided by l times e to the minus n pi k by l and minus e to the n pi k by l. So this is your coefficient. If f1 is given to you, you can sim uh, solve this integration. If f1 is given, you can solve this integration. So I got this as a, as a solution. So this is our solution for u1, sub, uh, where c1 is given by this. All right? So this is the solution of u1 you got. You have three more questions. All right? So solutions of u2, u3, and u4 are very similar. All right, and can be done. What is what is the difference? If you go back to this equation, what is the difference? U2 will satisfy the same equation, so you will get the same ODEs. All right, but U2 has U1x k is equal to F2 of x, and the first condition is zero. So again, your boundary value problem will not change. You will get this thing. You will get exactly this thing, uh, where. Uh, this will remain the same, but here instead of y k is equal to 0, you will get y 0 is equal to 0. And the boundary condition uh, u1 x k will be f2 of x and that will be used later on. So only the boundary conditions are changing, remaining whole procedure will, be, will remain the same. So it's very easy uh, to find u2, u3 and u4 and at the end of course our u x y will be nothing but the summation of all these and goes from 1 to 4 u and x, y. All right? I, I will add all four of them to get the general solution. All right? So this will be our 
final solution. So it's not really difficult. Um, we are doing the same thing which we have done before. All right. So this is the uh, solution of Laplace equation in a rectangle where the boundary conditions are not zero. All the boundary conditions are non-homogeneous. So we split our problem into four different problems where three of them becomes homogeneous and one is non-homogeneous and we can solve all those four separately and then add them up to get the solution of the given problem. All right. So let's see, uh, next is the uh, again Laplace equation in a circular disk. Let's change our domain instead of rectangle because we are in 2D now. If we are in two dimensional, there can be any type of region. I first solve in a rectangle. Now I am solving in a circle. So what will happen if I solve in a circle? Cir in a circle, there is no x is equal to 0, x is equal to k. There is no y is equal to 0, y is equal to l. Right? There is a problem now. In a circle, circle means the radius is a or radius is something which is fixed. So boundary comes from the radius only. All right. So what will happen that if we have a circle, all right, then whatever is the radius, all right, let's say radius is alpha, then this boundary is given by just r is equal to alpha. You know that. The radius is equal to alpha. This gives me the boundary. Now, boundary is just one r is equal to alpha. And we are not saying x and y. It's r. So it means I have to convert my problem, convert my equation to r polar coordinates r and theta all right so consider the equilibrium temperature in a uniform circular disk all right this is a circular disk d is equal to r theta where r bit is between 0 and alpha see r is between 0 and alpha and theta goes from 0 uh, minus pi to pi so you can take 0 to pi or minus pi to pi it's the same thing if you start from 0 uh, minus pi to pi it is the same thing as well so sometimes people uh, consider this one instead of writing from 0 to 2 pi, they write it from minus pi to pi. With no sources under the condition of prescribed temperature on the boundary r is equal to alpha is a constant. Because of the geometry of the problem, it is better to convert the boundary value problem in terms of polar coordinates r and theta with the pole at the center of the disk. <coughs> we use the famous relation between polar and Cartesian coordinates. These are very famous relations r x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta to reduce the Laplace equation u x x plus u y y is equal to 0 in this form. So if you <coughs> it's just simple application of chain rule here right if you want to convert uh, partial by partial x into r what you will do partial by partial r times partial r by partial x simple is this so your derivative will go to so you know what is partial r by partial x all right uh, r is x square plus y square square root so if you take the derivative this is uh, x by r similarly partial by partial y will become y by r times partial by partial r so you see the derivative respect to x can be converted to derivative respect to r Similarly, derivative with respect to theta can be converted to derivative with respect, uh, sorry, derivative with respect to y can also be converted to r and theta. So if you do that, this is the equation you will get. <coughs> All right, it's a little exercise if you try to uh, use chain rule and replace the values of uxx and uyy in terms of r and theta, you will arrive at this equation. urr plus 1 over r ur <coughs> plus 1 over r square u theta theta is equal to 0. This is the same Laplace equation in polar coordinates. All right. So in this case, the boundary conditions takes the form u x theta is bounded. u r negative pi is equal to u r pi. And u r negative pi is equal to u r pi. <coughs> 0 and r. So our, bound, uh, our conditions are periodic here. All right. So one is, one is that if you are <coughs> starting off, let's say, here right so what is happening here theta is a uh, negative pi and theta is pi right both this point uh, corresponds to pi and negative pi both so it means if I take the value of u at theta is equal to pi and the value of u at theta is equal to negative pi they should be equal because the point is the same so if you are approaching 
this way or this way you should approach to the same value and also your derivative respect to theta at minus pi and pi should be the same as well all right so these are the periodic boundary conditions and we have solved one problem of heat equation with periodic boundary conditions so this is these are the periodic boundary conditions and we impose another condition that because you see here when r is zero then we have this coefficients blowing up one over r and one over r square go to infinity as as r is equal to zero right so r is equal to zero is a singular point of this equation so we may we can expect that maybe at r is equal to zero u goes to infinity so that's why we impose the condition that you should remain bounded at r is equal to zero even if i take r is equal to zero you should not go to infinity so we we impose this condition of boundedness as well all right so let's solve an example for a circular disk solve the following initial boundary value problem u r r r theta plus 1 over r u r r theta plus 1 over r square u theta theta r theta is equal to 0 and r radius is from 0 to 2 u, uh, 0 r goes from 0 to 2 so radius is 2 basically theta from minus pi to pi the initial condition uh, the boundary condition is also given uh, these are the additional condition we have the boundary condition as i mentioned before the boundary will be given to us see r is equal to alpha this will be given to us all right temperature will be prescribed on the boundary so this is at r is equal to 2 that is the boundary of the circle it is 1 plus 8 sine theta minus 32 cos 4 theta minus pi theta and less than pi all right so uh, this is our example uh, clearly now u is a function of r and theta so if we use the separation of variables i need to assume the solution of the form the solution of the form u r theta so basically one function should be a function of r and the other should be a function of theta so r of r and theta of theta this is a capital theta and this is small theta all right so therefore the pde gives the pde gives what is PDE? U R R. So U R R means the second derivative of R theta as it is plus one over R. See one over R U R. So U R means the first derivative of R and theta as it is, and plus one over R square U theta theta. So R as it is and second derivative of theta with respect to theta is equal to zero so this is your uh, differential equation <coughs> partial differential equation here uh, we need to separate the variables so first of all we will divide by r and theta right if we divide by r theta you will get r double prime by r theta will be cancelled plus one over r r prime by r again theta will be cancelled plus 1 over r square r will be cancelled and theta double prime by theta is equal to 0 this is what you will get all right so now if i send this to the other side and multiply by r square as well so i will get r square r double prime by r plus r r prime by r is equal to minus theta double prime by theta I send it over there and multiply r on the left hand side now on the left hand side we have just small r and the uh, right hand side we have just small theta so see variables have been separated here as well so variable uh, separation uh, separation of variable actually uh, worked out here so I can call it again negative lambda or lambda whatever you want to call it all right so if i do that let's say it's a constant all right because one is a function of r other is a function of theta it has to be they have to be constant so now from here i got two equations r square r double prime i am multiplying this this r by lambda and then i'll bring it to the left hand side all right all right so now we have to check whether which problem should be solved first right this or this this is somehow 
is looking easier because this will be theta double prime plus lambda theta is equal to zero. All right, and this is kind of uh, the problem which we have been solving. But let's see the boundary conditions along with it. Boundary condition, these these periodic boundary conditions are on theta as well. So it means this theta should be solved first. I am keeping minus here, so let's call it plus lambda in this case. Why I am taking it plus lambda? Because now, <coughs> if you if you separate these two equations, you will get r double prime plus r r prime minus lambda r equal to zero, and theta double prime plus lambda theta is equal to zero. Because whenever I solved this kind of equation, I solved this with plus. So if I keep this minus here, then I will get minus on the left hand side, and I can solve it. That's not a problem. But just to keep ourselves consistent with what we have been doing in the last two three lectures, it's better to take uh, plus lambda here. And if you don't want to take plus lambda here, then keep this minus on the left hand side and take negative lambda. It will be the same thing. So these are the two ODEs I got. Now uh, the periodic conditions. Even if they are not given in the example, you see in the example they were not given, but the, these are understood. Whenever you are taking a problem in a circular disk, these two conditions are understood. All right, the periodic conditions become. Now the periodic conditions become um, u at r negative pi is equal to u r pi. So u r negative pi means r of r and theta at negative pi is equal to r of r and theta at pi. So r and r are not equal to zero; they can be cancelled out. So it means theta at negative pi, capital theta, is equal to capital theta at pi. All right. Similarly, the second one that u theta at r negative pi should be equal to u theta at r pi this will give you theta prime at negative pi same as theta prime at pi so therefore the boundary value problem becomes therefore the boundary value problem is theta double prime plus lambda theta is equal to 0 with the periodic boundary condition that theta pi is equal to theta negative pi is equal to theta pi And theta prime negative pi is equal to theta pi. So again, <coughs> you can solve this system. In the last lecture where we finished our lecture, I finished with this boundary value problem. All right. If you recall, I solved this boundary value problem with periodic boundary conditions, and we got n pi square as our uh, yes, n pi square as our eigenvalues and. And pi by l square as our eigen values, and sine and cosine both were our eigen functions in this case, right? Remember that from the last lecture. From last lecture, we solved this problem. So lambda n were equal to n pi by l, but l is pi in our case. You see, l is pi here, so that is n square only. Because pi and pi cancel out, and eigen functions were sine and cosine both. So phi zero was one because one was constant. When you took lambda equal to zero, it was a constant, and basically you can write phi n was both sine n theta and cosine n theta. These were both our eigen functions. All right. If you recall from the last lecture, so what we can do is we can uh, give them the notation that phi zero of theta is equal to one, uh, which was constant. Cos zero is one and sine zero is zero. You are getting just one. And other two, you can call them one and one and theta is equal to uh, cosine n theta and phi uh, theta two n theta is equal to sine n theta. So you can basically. Um, Uh, name them because both are eigen functions so call them 1 and 2 5 1 and 5 uh, sorry theta 1 and theta 2 and because we have subscript n as well so theta 1n and theta 2n so i got all these uh, uh, functions so for for 1n i am getting two eigen functions cos and sin both all right so now the other equation is now the ode for r is 
what is our ODE for R? R square R double prime plus R R prime minus lambda and lambda is N square now. R is equal to 0. Alright, I replaced N lambda is equal to n. Since lambda was n square, so I am replacing here lambda value of lambda is replaced by n square. Do you remember what kind of equation this is? This is a second order cauchy euler equation. In ODEs you must have learned this. This is a cauchy euler equation. What is cauchy euler equation? Uh, the, co the coefficients are not constant in that case, but the coefficient depends on R, right? One more thing is the power of R and the derivative they match. The first derivative, so first power of R. Second derivative, second power of R is being multiplied. If there is third derivative, third power, power of R will be multiplied. This type of equation is called a Cauchy equation and the solution of the Cauchy equation is of the form and the solution is of the form the solution of the Cauchy equation is of the form capital R is equal to x to the power n sorry r to the power n but n is already being used here so I can call it r to the power maybe alpha t x because x y are variables uh, n is also being used here so let's use uh, p here r to the power p for some p. For some p this type of solution will happen because you see uh, when you take r to the power p you differentiate it once one power is subtracted. You will get p r p minus 1 but when you multiply by r you will again get r to the power p back. Similarly here r double prime will have r to the power p minus 2 but r square is being multiplied so again you will get r p. So r p r p r p will be common each term so you can expect some p's so that this becomes the solution. Alright so now here if you replace uh, the o in this ODE this is ODE so I can therefore the ODE gives uh, R square R double prime. R double prime is R uh, P times P minus 1 R to the power P minus 2 plus R R prime. R prime is P R P minus 1 right and minus N square R and that is R P is equal to 0. Now you see this is P times P minus 1 R P. This is P R P and minus n square R P. So see R P is common. So P times P minus 1 plus P minus n square times R P is equal to 0. This is what you got. Since R P is the solution and this can never be equal to 0. We are taking R P as the solution and this can never be equal to 0. So this is possible only if P times P minus 1 plus P minus n square is equal to 0. This is the auxiliary equation we got for this type of problems. So you have p square minus p plus p minus n square is equal to 0. P, p is gone. So you got p square minus n square is equal to 0. So the values you got are plus and minus n. Alright. So therefore the solutions are, therefore the solutions are r to the power n and r to the power minus n. These are because I got two values of p plus and minus n. So r n is a, is a solution as well as r to the minus n. These both will be the solutions of this Cauchy Euler equation. So the general solution will be therefore the general solution will be r of r is equal to c1 r n plus c2 r minus n. If there are two solutions linearly independent solutions then their linear combination is also a solution of the ordinary differential equation. So I got R, I got theta so I can write the product solutions now. Alright so these are the solutions and these are the solution only if n is not equal to 0. You see if n is equal to 0 then there is no such term as n n. Alright so this is this is true if n is not equal to 0. Alright. So if n is equal to 0, we will do something else. Then it is r square r double prime plus r r prime is equal to 0. Because if n is 0, then this term drops out. 
If n is 0, then this term drops out. And you will get only first two terms here. You can cancel one of the powers because right hand side is 0. Now this is nothing but the derivative of r r prime. If you take the product rule, r as it is derivative of r prime is r double prime plus r prime as it is derivative of r is 1. So you can write this as this. So this implies that if you integrate once, if you integrate it is r times r prime is equal to constant. Right? Constant C1. And now if you divide constant by this r, you will get r prime and integrate once more. If you integrate once more, you will get C1 log of r plus C2. So this is the case when you have n is equal to 0. So this is the solution for n not equal to 0. This is the solution if n is equal to 0. All right. Now if you recall, we have one more condition associated with this problem was that u0 theta should remain bounded. I have used this condition to obtain eigenfunctions. I have not used this condition. So u theta, u0 theta is unbounded. We have this condition. Should mean that r of r is unbounded. Sorry, bounded. Not unbounded. U, u, r of r of 0 r of 0 because u th is, uh, theta uh, 0 theta means r at 0 and theta at theta is bounded we know that theta is bounded you see from here this is always bounded no problem you know that sine and cosine functions can never exceed 1 or minus 1 so they are always bounded functions so we have no problem with theta we have no problem with this one so we only have conditions on r that r at 0 should remain bounded right so this is the condition that r at 0 but now if you look at here even for n we have r of r is c1 log of r plus c2 if n is equal to 0 and uh, uh, rn you can write and c1 e to the maybe we introduce different letters uh, the book which i was fo i'm following uh, is writing prime for this c1 bar c2 bar because these co constants should be different right this c1 c2 should be different than this c1 c2 c1 r to the power n plus c2 r to the power minus n if n is not equal to 0 Th these are the solutions r n at 0 or r 0 of 0 let's say first i declare this one r c1 of 0 is bounded if and only if c1 is equal to 0. The reason is this log of r, this will never be bounded. You know that at r is equal to 0, log of r is negative infinity. Right? So if this term is inside your solution, then r0 will never be bounded function. So to make it bounded, I can take c1 to be equal to 0 so that I can get rid of log of r. There is no other way to get, because c1 is arbitrary, so I can take it equal to 0. Otherwise, it will never be a bounded function. All right. So this implies that c zero of r is a constant c two. All right, and r n of zero is bounded if this is bounded if c1 is equal to 0. Why? Uh, because r to the power n, this is an unbounded function. If r, uh, sorry, not this one. I, I should have c2 is equal to 0. I should have c2 equal to 0 because this is 1 over rn. Because the coefficient of c2 is 1 over rn. And as r goes to 0, 1 over rn goes to infinity. So this term will never be, uh, will never be bounded. If this is there, it will never be a bounded function. So I need to make this c2 equal to 0 so that I can get rid of this whole term and I get c1 rn. Alright, so this implies that your rn at r is equal to c1 rn. So this should be your solution. 
I need to get rid of the other two parts because they make this solution unbounded. So using the bounded netness condition, I got this value and I got this value. All right, so now I have R n and theta n. I can easily find the values of uh, u n x t r theta. And now you see, if I take n to be zero here, n equal to zero is r to the power zero is a constant, right? So this is a constant function. So now I can write that my r n of r is nothing but just r to the power n, where n goes from zero, one, two, and so on. Because when n is equal to zero, this gives me one. One is a constant. That's fine. And why I I am dropping these constants c1 and c1 bar? I drop these coefficients just because when I will write the general solution, I will again introduce the arbitrary constants there. So that's why I'm not writing constants here as the case with this one. I'm not writing constants here because when I take the product, I will write a constant with them. All right. So these are your solutions for r n and theta n. All right. So I got the solutions for r and theta. Now I can. Now I can write the uh, general solution of the uh, Laplace equation, which is u of r theta as a product solution. So first I have to write the product solution. Then using the principle of superposition, I'll add them up. So therefore, the general solution of the given problem in a circular disk is. Uh, a u of r theta is first of all n is equal to zero. For n is equal to zero, I can introduce a constant a naught, a naught r naught r and theta naught theta. Plus summation n goes from one to infinity. R n r. We have two thetas. Thetas are two for n is equal to n, so I will introduce constants a n and b n for that. A n, a n theta one n theta plus b n theta two n theta. Right? We had two solutions for theta, sine and cosine both. So now if I replace a naught is a constant, r naught is one, and theta naught is also one. So these both are one. So I am getting just a naught. n goes from one to infinity. R n theta is r to the power n, and a n uh, a n theta one is cosine n theta plus b n is uh, b n sine n theta. So I got a complete Fourier series. You see for r theta. Now this is our general solution, all right. And now I have to use the initial condition which was given. What was the initial condition? That u at two theta is equal to In our problem, u at two theta is equal to um, let's say it's f theta. In general, you can have let's say a theta that at r is equal to a. Let's say radius is a. This is uh, at r is equal to a. You have uh, u is equal to f. Let's say this is your general condition. Then general condition you will get f theta is equal to u a theta, and I have to replace r is equal to a. So n goes from one to infinity, a to the power n, a n cos n theta plus b n sine n theta, and this is a full Fourier series. You see, a n r is there, a n and b n are there, and this is a constant. So this constant can be with a n and with b n. So these are two constant coefficients of cos n and sin n theta. This is a Fourier series. You can easily obtain a naught, a n, and b n from there. And what will be the values? So this implies that a naught is equal to two uh, by l from minus pi to pi, because your theta is from minus pi to pi. This is a series in theta, a Fourier series in theta. It's a Fourier series in theta, so you have to write uh, from minus pi to pi, uh, and two by l, l is pi here. Uh, this will be one by pi f theta d theta. This will be your a naught, a n will be a n will be one over pi. But here you see the coefficient is not just a n; it is a to the power n a n. So I, it, it is a to the power n a n. So I can divide this and write it here, and write minus pi to pi uh, f theta cosine n theta d theta, and b n 
bn also has a n with it so I can just remove it and write 1 over pi a n from minus pi to pi f theta sin n theta so these are your coefficients so for any f theta these are your coefficients you can calculate for any f theta you can calculate a naught a n and b n replace them here a naught a n and b n and that will be your final solution <coughs> in our uh, example if you go back and see in our example our initial condition is this 1 plus 8 sin theta minus 32 cos 4 theta in our case u 2 theta is 1 minus 8 sin theta minus 34 cos 4 theta 1 plus 8 sin theta minus 34 cos 4 theta and u 2 theta so basically it is 1 plus 8 sin theta minus 34 cosine 4 theta and if you see these are the eigenfunctions one is the eigenfunction sine theta cos 4 theta these are eigenfunctions so whenever your initial condition is given in terms of eigenfunctions don't integrate just compare the coefficients because right hand side also have sine theta cos theta terms left hand side also given as sine theta cos theta terms so why integrate just compare the coefficients equal to a naught plus summation n goes from 1 to infinity uh, 2 to the power n because a is 2n now it's a n cosine n theta plus b n sine n theta so I'm not integrating I can just compare so by comparing a naught is 1 because this constant should be equal to constant sine 1 theta sine 1 theta is given here see n is equal to 1 so sine 1 theta means your b1 is given as 8 your b1 is 8 and then cosine 4 theta so cosine 4 theta is n4 so a4 is given 2 to the power 4 a4 is given to the negative 32 so I have only four uh, coefficients a naught is 1 b1 is 4 and a4 is also 1 negative 1 because 2 to the power 4 is 32 right no 16 so this is 2 2 to the power 4 is 16 so it is negative 2 alright so these are only uh, three coefficients which we are getting all others are 0 alright all other a n and b n are 0 because they uh, by comparing all other a n and b n should be equal to 0 so therefore your final answer u r theta should be equal to a naught which is 1 plus summation r to the power n but I am not getting r to the power n I am only getting a4 so I am getting r to the power 4 and a4 is negative 2 cos 4 theta and then I am getting plus b1 so it means r to the power 1 b1 which is 4 and sine 1 theta so this is all I'm getting 1 minus 2 r 4 cosine 4 theta plus 4 r sine theta so this is your solution series has reduced to just three terms all other coefficients were zero so that's why the series reduced to only three terms so this is our solution for the uh, Laplace equation in a circular disk where the condition one condition a boundary value boundary condition was given to us but we used the periodic conditions which are known conditions for a circular disk and a boundedness conditions to obtain other coefficients as well and that's how we completed our solution if f theta this initial condition is not given if this initial condition is not uh, of the form of eigenfunctions then we need to replace f theta here then we need to replace f theta here to obtain the values of a naught a n and b n we did not integrate in this case because our function was a combination of eigenfunctions so I just compared these two uh, uh, these two series with the given function to obtain the coefficients alright so we saw this example in great detail and now um, let's review what we have studied today the summary of today's lecture was again separation of variable technique for elliptic equation and in particular for Laplace equation so we solved Laplace equation in a rectangle in Cartesian coordinates but then we solved Laplace equation in a disk circular disk so for circular disk we have to change our equation to polar coordinates and we solved our equation in polar coordinates and these were two very uh, brief uh, 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 and uh, 
explanatory examples of separation of variable techniques for Laplace equation and in circular disk as well. All right. So this was it for today's lecture. I'll see you in the next lecture. Till then, Allah Hafiz. Assalamu alaikum.